on Psalm 56.3. I think some of you are familiar with this. The verse goes like this. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Can you repeat it with me? What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Again? What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Yeah, and so the song goes like this. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. I will trust in thee. I will trust in thee. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Psalm 56, 3, again. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. I will trust in thee. I will trust in thee. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Psalm 56, 3. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It is an honor to stand before God's people. The honor is all the more greater when it's the Sabbath day. Let us pray as we study our Bibles together. Faithful Father, it is our privilege. It is a joy. It is an outstanding blessing to be in your presence. Unworthy broken and battered by sin, but loved by a loving Father. We thank you for the privilege to be in your presence this holy, blessed Sabbath day. And there is a burning desire in our hearts, Lord, that we would get closer to you. And the Bible explains to us that a desire is not enough. We would have to go deeper. And through the past days, this experience which you have given to us called knees for Jesus. You have taught us the truth, the depth, the value of how prayer, prayer can connect us back to our Father. Bless us now, O Lord, as we continue to take this journey. Wash us clean of our sins so that we can behold the face of our Savior. Teach us, inspire us, instruct us, instruct us, O Lord, so that we would not go astray. This is what we plead. This is what we beg. This is what we cry out for. For we need you in this hour. Holy Spirit, will you please take control? We need you to captivate us, mesmerize us, destroy the self within, so that you can be uplifted within us. Teach us the importance of prayer and why one ought to pray. Guide us, O oh Lord, please. Please guide us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. One more time. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I hear a few voices from here, but this side is quite dead. I'm praying that we will be Awake by the time I'm done. I'd like us to turn our Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 2. The book of Exodus chapter 2, it will be our beginning passage for our study this afternoon. Exodus chapter 2. The context is of prayer. And I always stand amazed at the attempt to explain what prayer is. I believe it was very aptly taught to us when we were growing up. And I still find no better way to be able to put it in simple words uh, that it is communication uh, between you and your Creator. Uh, and yes, much definition and, and pretext and post text has come to that, and yet we come back to the experience of that communicative being. Let us go to Exodus chapter 2. The emphasis will be on verses 23 to 25. Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. Now it happened in the process of time 
that the king of Egypt died. The context to the story is that the children of Israel are in bondage for about 400 years. And the Bible chronicles it in Exodus 2, saying that in the process of time, the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, with Jacob. He looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. In fact, the King James would say, and God had respect towards them. Interesting context of the book of Exodus. By the way, if you go through the book of Exodus, you will not find the word pray. You will not find a formal context of people gathering together under a roof and there is a worship service and there is a prayer service or there is a prayer camp. That experience is almost unknown to the Israelite generation in bondage. And so here it is in Exodus 2, 23 to 25 and as you look through the whole book of Exodus, there is so much pain and so much distress and so much trouble. And yet throughout the book, you don't find a, a formal setting of prayer where people get together and say, we're going through a trouble. Let us all pray together. And, and which is why the book fascinates me, because in spite of all the burdens and struggles, they were not experiencing prayer as you and I do in this modern day and age. Let's go one more time to the book of Exodus chapter 2 and those three verses because while it seems like it's not there, while it seems like the word prayer might not be there or the, prayer, the word prayer would not appear, prayer is actually there. Let's take a look at it. Exodus 2 verses 23 to 25. It happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel sighed by reason of bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant. Interestingly, Israel is sighing, Israel is crying, and the Bible says their sighing and crying and groaning came up to God. The usage of the words going up is always, whether in the context of the sanctuary and the offerings being made and the sweet aroma going up to God, or whether in the modern context when we teach the young little children that uh, the blessings come down and our prayers go up. It is in that context that Exodus 2 defines prayer. While not using the word prayer, it, it, it puts an amazing facet to prayer saying that when Israel was sighing, when Israel was crying, and when Israel was groaning, all these emotions went up to God, and God heard them. And just so we know, God considered them as prayers. We know that because in the very next, in the very next passage, as soon as God hears, interestingly, read Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. Israel is sighing. Israel is crying. Israel is groaning. God says, all of this has come up to me. As a result, I will speak to Moses. I don't know if you are with me, Exodus 2 and 3 have summed up the very relationship experience we are talking about in prayer when our prayers go up and answers come in return. Exodus 2, 23 to 25, while not using the word, the term prayer, it is a prayer of sigh, of cry, of groaning which goes up to God and as a result God sends and speaks to Moses. I want us to pay attention to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. 
And Moses said, I will now turn aside verse 3, Exodus 3, verse 3, and see this great sight, why this bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the bush. My brothers and sisters, you have to pay attention. In the context of prayer, this bonded human race called the Israelites are lifting up a prayer. Their prayer is not in the formal context of sitting and kneeling and united prayer and the different sessions of prayer. Their prayer goes up as a cry, as a sigh, as a groan. God hears as a result of God listening to their cries and groans. God says, I have a solution. As a result of that, he calls a man, Moses, but I need us to, to pay attention what happens right after you pray and what is the result one should expect after prayer. Let's pay attention from this amazing book of Exodus chapter. Chapter 3. In verse 2 of Exodus 3, the angel of the Lord appears unto him in a flame of fire. So it is God himself who is in that, in that burning bush. The Bible says in verse 2 that the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. In other words, there was fire all over, but the bush was not being consumed or destroyed. Verse 3, Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Moses is amused. Moses says, let me turn aside. I want to take a look at what's happening to this bush. Verse 4, pay attention. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the midst of the bush. Here is a man amused by the sight. A prayer has just been offered that Moses is unaware of. A prayer has just gone up to God. God has heard this sighing, this crying, this groaning. And as a result, he wants to connect with humanity as he always has. But he's trying to reach out to this man. The Bible says in verse 4, When the Lord saw that Moses turned aside from his everyday business, when Moses turned aside to look into the face of God, it is then that God called him. Brothers and sisters, we have been taking an experience starting Wednesday evening when my beloved brother spoke to us about the concept of neology. Uh, last night we studied when you pray, referring to time and attitude. And then this morning we were, talked, uh, we were discussing the necessity of prayer and how prayer is all about God and not about self. It is in that context that Exodus 3 verse 4, we're taking a progressive journey, that Exodus 3 verse 4 puts us into that understanding that the purpose of prayer, the purpose of prayer is to get somebody connected to God. And as I move through the course of this message, it is by God's grace that I will end with the ultimate purpose of why we pray. Why is it so necessary to stay in prayer? So pay attention to verse 4. Moses, everyday business, he's tending his sheep, he's grazing them along on the fields, and immediately a burning bush. Moses leaves his everyday business and he turns aside from his business. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, it is then that God called him. We were studying this morning that some people are only praying for forgiveness. Others only go up as high as forgiveness and then cleansing. But nobody's praying for empowerment. Nobody's praying for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. See, it is that journey that God wants us to take. That right after prayer, what is the result? The result of prayer should be that somebody's attention should be drawn towards God and not away from God. Otherwise, like everybody else, we can be caught up in the endless cycle of presenting our requests and presenting our grocery lists and then expecting an answer and then the next day presenting another list of materials to be bought and purchased by God and delivered at our doorstep. And the cycle just continues. And Exodus 3 verse 4 is saying, the purpose of prayer is to get your attention and get your eyes and get your face turned towards God. When the man Moses turned aside from his business, from his everyday cycle of life, and when he turned into the face of God, it is only then that verse 4 says that God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. My brothers and sisters, God wants every child, every son and daughter of God to go out and tell the world. So a purpose of prayer through the eyes of Moses is that if we spend enough time in prayer. 
or when we turn our face away from our everyday business and turn our face to God, get ready, God is going to call you. Otherwise, the cycle is endless, the process is continuous, and it keeps going on over and over again endlessly. Why? Because we, we have gotten used to the concept of prayer being selfish. The concept of prayer being all about me as we studied this morning. There are yet others who mistake the concept of prayer. And I'd like us to go to Exodus 2 where we read these three verses. The children of Israel were only sighing and crying and groaning. And when the sighs, the cries, and the groan came up to God, God said, it has come up to me in the form of prayer, and I will answer your prayer. My brothers and sisters, have you ever been, ever been there? I've been there, and I want to ask you, have you ever been in a situation when your heart is so broken? You have gone through such a terrible experience. You have been tortured and abused. You have just experienced a failure. You have just gone through a downfall. You are in the lowest pit of your life and you don't even have the courage to muster up a few words. And there you are on your bed. You don't even have the strength to kneel. You lie on that bed facing upwards and all you do is... <sighs> have you ever been there? My brothers and sisters, each time you've done that, you've prayed. Each time you've done that because you did not have the energy, the heart was so broken, the spirit was so vexed, you did not know what to say and you just sighed. Oftentimes you came and you, you wet your pillow to sleep. Other times you were there and you could not stop groaning because of the hatred shown towards you. The anger protested towards you and you could not help but weep. You could not help but groan in all those experiences you were offering up prayers to God. I want us to know then that prayer is not about words. Prayer is an experience. Prayer is not what's coming out of your mouth. Prayer is what you are going through. The children of Israel, for them, prayer was not a prayer camp experience. Prayer was not a knees for Jesus experience because their knees were so shattered and broken. Each time they did go on their knees, they were sighing and crying. And God was listening to those prayers offered by his children. It is interesting to me how God in those tears, how God in those sighs, how God in those groanings sees adjectives, he sees nouns, he sees pronouns, he sees prepositions, and, and, and every teardrop is like a, a punctuation mark, and every sigh is like an apostrophe in the eyes of God. And every tear that wets your pillow is, is, is like a sentence of prayer. And God says, it comes up to me, it is not ignored. No wonder the Bible says, he sees every heart. Sighing and groaning. Some say, well, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that groaning is prayer. How can, how can groaning be prayer? Uh, the text was read this morning and I'd like us to go there again, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. One more time, Romans 8 and verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Number one, the reason is this why I like this passage. Number one, likewise the Spirit also helpeth. The Bible says the Spirit helps. When you read that word help in the Greek, it's the Greek word sunati labanamai. It's a big word. Don't get caught up there. The word, Greek word uh, sunati labanamai means, literally means to go around the other corner and, and help you with your burden. I'd like to illustrate this. Uh, Kim, could you please come up for me? We'd like to illustrate this point a little bit better. 
Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth. And oftentimes, we begin to feel that this help is in some sort of unseen experience and some felt experience. It's not real. It's not true. And if you read the, the truest context in which Paul is trying to describe the ministry of the Holy Spirit, this is what it means. Can you hold the other end of the, of the pulpit? Uh, the Paul is saying in Romans 8, 26, that likewise the Spirit also helpeth. And the word helpeth in the Greek literally means somebody going around the other side and helping you lift up that burden that you cannot lift by your own self. Are you with me? The word helpeth there in the Greek means that when you are trying to lift up a burden that's too heavy, the Spirit helpeth. Helpeth in the sense that he comes around the corner and he holds up the other portion, other side of the burden and then it is not you praying alone, it is the Spirit lifting up your burden with you and offering it up unto the Lord. My friends, prayer is, prayer is special. Prayer is very, very special. Why? Because God himself, verse 26 is saying, God himself comes and helps you lift up this burden and present it to the Lord. Why? The Bible says because we don't know what to pray for, which is why the Spirit itself makes its intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. See, the Bible says in Romans 8, 26 that the Spirit has to groan. Over there in Ephesians, the Bible says we vex the Spirit many times. And, and, and I'm sure the Spirit is so vexed and, and sometimes we've pushed the Spirit so hard and our situation, what we put ourselves is in is so difficult a situation, the Holy Spirit cannot help but groan to Jesus. Groan as He offers up our prayer. My brothers and sisters, if the Spirit groans, so do we. If the Spirit groans and is considered as a prayer to Jesus, so are our groans, our sighs, and our tears, sighing, crying, and groaning. Exodus has this splattered all over the book, and yet we would not take the time to appreciate it. Over there in Revelation, there is an amazing passage. There is an amazing passage over there in Revelation where the saints are gathered. They gathered these these beings are gathered around the throne of God and they have a golden platter. Uh, I'd like us to, to go there with me. Uh, turn your Bibles with me to, to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation and I think it is chapter 5 if I'm not mistaken. Revelation chapter 5, in the context of what the beings in the presence of God are doing, it is in verse 8, Revelation 5 and verse 8, and when he had taken the book, referring to Jesus who takes the book, the four beasts, the four and twenty elders, they fell down before the Lamb, Revelation 5 and verse 8, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, one more time, when Jesus takes the book, the book that nobody else is, able, is worthy to take, the four beasts and 24 elders, they fall down before the Lamb. And each of them have in their hands harps, and they also have in their hand golden vials. And these vials are full of odors. And verse 8 says, these golden vials full of odors, the odors are the prayers of saints. See, in Revelation 5, when, when prayers are offered, Revelation 5 is saying these elders and these beings present prayers to God in golden vessels. You prayed a menial prayer. You were rushing out of your house and, God, please take care of me today. I don't have time. I'm in a rush. And you closed the door and you ran out. But the Bible says beings presented that prayer to God on a golden platter. It begins to amaze me that heaven respects prayer more than we do. Heaven has more respect towards prayer more than we ever could offer to God. See, oftentimes one is praying and can hardly believe whether they're 
their prayer is actually true. Uh, while, while heaven is saying, I'm, we're desirous to hear your prayers, while God is saying, I'm anxious to, to spend time with my people, here are a people who would hardly lift up a prayer to God, and when one does lift up a prayer to God, it almost seems like it's with such emptiness. It's with such emptiness that one would offer up that prayer. Oftentimes, that element of, of faith is just missing. And I was telling my friends the other day as we were praying together of a man who was converted from, from a religion in India, a, a very deep pagan religion in India in his everyday business and idols and, and chants and vain repetitions. He was rescued from that faith and he gave his life to the Lord and accepted him through baptism and became a Christian and a devout Christian for that matter. And all around the land of India, his name was famous and he traveled the length and breadth of the country and he came to pass through one town. And as he was approaching the borders of the town, he met a, 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 an official from the town. And as his official met this person, he said, uh, Dear good sir, we've heard a lot about you, and we have a request to place before you. We would like you to pray for our town, for there have been no rains in our town for a very, very long time. Could you please pray so that there would be rain in our town? And this man of God, who is a man of prayer, he says, my brother, let us pray to God right now. And as they were about to pray, this town official, who happens to be a pagan, he is not a Christian, knows nothing about the Christian God. And he turns to this man who is a man of prayer, a man of God known throughout the land. He tells him, my brother, please stop. Don't pray right now. Because if you pray right now, you don't have an umbrella. I don't have an umbrella. If you pray and it begins to rain, we will have have nowhere to hide ourselves. Stop, don't pray right now. Pray when we get to the border of the town. When we're at the gates, then you pray so that if it rains, we have somewhere to hide. Well, that seems a far-fetched story. The Bible tells that it actually happened. There was a man, Elijah, who began to pray in 1 Kings 18, and he himself had to hide for cover because there was a downpour of rain. In the 1800s, another story is told of a man by the name George Mueller. You've heard the story. George Mueller in the 1800s was a godly man, a man of prayer, who had helped many children grow up, many people come to the faith. George Mueller in the 1800s, had about 300 people in the orphanage, 300 young children in the orphanage. One morning they get up and there is no food for anybody to eat in the house. And the kitchen announces to George Mueller, George, there is no food for anybody to eat. And George announces there is nothing to worry about. Set the children on the table, wash the plates, clean the spoons, get them ready to eat. And the kitchen says, but we have no food. George says, just follow what I said. And everybody goes, all 300 children, they sit at the table. Everybody's ready to eat without an ounce of grain in the kitchen. George Miller goes on his knees and he says, Lord, you've always provided. And we know you will provide today as well. A few minutes from then, there is a knock on the door. The baker is on the door and he says, sir, I could not sleep all night because I was disturbed and I had to get up this morning and the Lord told me that I had to deliver some bread to you. I've baked, I got up early this morning and baked three batches of bread just for you. I hope you could use them. And George says, thank you very much. This is exactly what we needed. While they're eating the bread, there is another knock on the door and they open the door this time and there is a milkman. He says, sir, I'm so sorry to disturb you. I am working my way to go deliver these milk cans but I have these big gallons of milk but my, my, my cycle has broken down and by the time I get to fix the tire the milk would be spoiled would you like to have some free milk and George Mueller says my friend that's exactly what we needed my friends we often pray with a heart unconvinced it was my fear as knees for Jesus was coming into place, it was my fear that we would come and say, Lord, bless us, but never expect that to actually happen. 
We were expecting, Lord, please come and bless us and make us a mighty nation and revive us. But then again, by Sabbath evening, go back to our everyday business. And I was, I was getting afraid, Lord, please don't let Knees for Jesus be that event where people come, pray, profess to receive a blessing, but we all go home empty. Lord, help us that when we pray, may we pray that we have already believed it. We have already received it. No wonder in Steps to Christ, page 51 and paragraph 2 the prophet of the Lord says this do not wait to feel that you are made whole do not wait to feel that you are made whole in the context of you praying for forgiveness or you claiming a blessing do not wait to feel that you are made whole but instead say that I believe it not because you feel it but because God has promised my friends what have you gotten tired praying for about which God has said I am already going to do it is a promise from God he said he's gonna make it happen what is it then that you've gotten tired praying about and God has said, keep praying. If I've promised it, I am a promise keeper, and I will keep my promise. My friends, I'd like us to pay attention because the concept of prayer is serious and sincere. I'd like us to go to the book of Luke chapter 11. I was fascinated because as pastor was preaching this morning, I was studying the same passage and I was excited because the Spirit wanted us to understand something. Luke chapter 11. I'll tell you why often the concept of prayer is so misconceptualized and, and misunderstood. It is because of this. Let's go through this amazing prayer. Our Father, Luke 11 and verse 2. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, uh, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the, and the context and the concept of the model prayer is presented there. Oftentimes that model prayer is misunderstood because, my friends, the word prayer... The English word prayer comes from the, the Latin word precarious. And the word precarious means to beg. Uh, the word prayer from that old Latin word which means precarious, which means to beg, often takes us away from the whole understanding of prayer because we can turn away from actually conversing with God to end up just begging and begging and begging before God and just presenting request after request after request without actually having to have a conversation with God which is why which is why listen to this when Jesus began when Jesus was asked the question Lord teach us how to pray is the is our theme song verse 2 says Jesus said when you pray begin by saying our father in heaven you need to pay attention this is the first time in the New Testament as Jesus begins to talk about the concept of prayer he begins he says when you pray begin by saying our father and I need you to know that immediately as every Jew around Jesus heard this our father it lifted up their ears and he said did he just say our father they were amused they were shocked they were amazed how could he just say our father why because every other Jew you go from Abraham Isaac Jacob everybody looked unto God as God and everybody was calling unto God and that that essence of God and godliness and his holiness was always there to the point that it had made people fear God and not love him very interestingly a, a woman from Pakistan who gave her life to the Lord after living a life in, 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 the, in the understanding of the Islamic faith, when she gave her life to Christ, her conversion story is very aptly titled this. The title of her conversion story is, I dared to call him father. I dared to call him father. Why? Because everybody around her was so afraid to have a relationship with God because he's some high and exalted being who I, have, I, I am only to be submitted under and never to be able to talk to, only sit down under him and never ask 
and he questions, never ever talk to him, never even look up to him. And Jesus said, when you pray, guys, begin by praying our Father. My brothers and sisters, we have a problem. Majority of the times the church has stopped praying because they've forgotten that they're actually praying to their Father. Everybody thinks they're praying to some high and exalted king, some high great monarch, somebody who's waiting to execute judgment upon us as a dictator. And the Bible tells me in the words of Jesus, you're not praying to a high and exalted king while he is a king, while he is a creator of the universe, while he is the great and mighty one, he is my father. And I remember as a kid running to my father with boldness, I sometimes would carry my friends and he said, and every, if ever there was a conversation, I would brag, my father is able to do it. My brothers and sisters, we all ought to talk like that about our father in heaven. For our father is truly able. I remember about a story as related of a pastor when he was very, very young. He said we were learning how to drive a car and we were driving in and we were driving out of the driveway and we wanted to go a little bit further back and a little bit further in and we tried to go further back more onto the street and then back into the garage and one after other, our friends and brothers were taking turns trying to park the car in and drive the park car, take the car out and in this excitement of taking the car in and out, one of them ran over the leg of another and this guy was in pain and his leg was shattered and as he lied he was lying there everybody the friends gathered are you are you okay are you okay and just then they see one of the fathers of one of the guys coming from across the street from his house as he crosses the road everybody's afraid that he's coming and he's going to be very upset because we were playing with his car just then as the father approaches they begin to tell this guy get up get up quit up stand up quickly or else our father will be very upset get up quickly or else he will scold us and the man wanted to get up the little boy wanted to get up he did not want himself and the friends to be in trouble but could not his knee was shattered his ankle was broken he could not get up and just then the father approached and he is the one who picked up that little boy without a word from his mouth he put him in the car and without saying anything he took him to the hospital and without another word he fixed up that leg and without anything else he brought him home my friends that day what happened to the boys it was what happens to you and me every single day we fail to understand that the man who we have pushed across the road, the God who we have left away from our situations is the only God who can help us when your knee is shattered, is the only God who can lift you up when your ankle is broken and we forget to call upon the only one who can actually help us in our struggles and trials of life. So what is it that I'm saying to you, my friends, as I end, I'd like to dwell on just the prayer that we took a look at this morning. It begins by saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. See, prayer is all about God. We studied that this morning and notice First, it begins, Father, Father, your kingdom, your glory, your power. And then anything is said about daily bread. My brothers and sisters, you, we have to learn to put God first in all things. And the Lord's Prayer teaches us exactly that, that in this mortal prayer, we have to seek first the things of God, which means God's name has to be hallowed. His kingdom should be thought about. His will should be dwelt upon. And only then should one ever consider the thought of daily bread and the forgiveness of sin and the list that continues. God always has to be the focus. But I want to ask you, what is the prime objective of prayer? My friends, the prime objective of prayer is this. Listen and pay close attention. Every passage in the Bible is only understood in the context in which it is written, in the context in which it was spoken, and in the context of how events flowed. I'd like us to pay attention to Luke chapter 11. And he discusses the model prayer till verse 4. And in verse 5, Jesus says these words. He said to them, which of you shall have a friend 
Go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. He will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Listen, right after prayer is discussed, Jesus says that this is the model prayer. I'm giving you an outline which you should follow when you pray. Right after talking about prayer, he discusses the issue of persistence. My friends, how often we have prayed and have gotten tired of what we're praying for and God has already promised, I'm going to do this, but we've gotten tired to pray for. Why? Because he's not doing it on our time. Is somebody there? Lord, I asked you to do this, but you've not done it on my time schedule. And God is saying it is never about your time. It is always about my time. And we so often quote, oh, his thoughts are higher than ours. His ways are higher than ours. Then my friends, you need to understand that his time is different than ours also. His time is higher than ours also. And what you're pushing for right now, he, say, he is saying, I will let that happen in my time, not in yours. Prayer then is set in the context of persistence. So in the period of waiting, what does one do? You sit around and watch? No. You have to be persistent is the point of Jesus. So right after discussing prayer, he says the next thing you need to know is that you need to learn to persist. If you are persistent, you shall receive that which you are pleading with God for. But my friends, pay attention to this. The context is amazing. He says that if this friend is begging, to his friend and he's knocking on his door, but this friend is asleep. It is a, it is a extremely amazing contrast to the one we are praying to. Because here you are, and Jesus is saying, you might be knocking on someone's door who's asleep, but learn to knock on the door of Jesus because the Bible tells me our God never sleeps. And he says, even though this guy might not have enough food, when you knock on heaven's door, you got nothing to worry about because there's always more food. And even though this guy might not want to rise up and help you, the Father in heaven is always ready to come out and help you. But if you are persistent, you shall be rewarded. What's the end point to this? After prayer, Jesus says, learn to persist. After persistence, he says these words, verse 9, Luke 11, verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock, it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. And then he says this, again, asking, seeking, knocking, again in the context of prayer. He says, if a son, verse 11, asks for bread from any father among you, Will he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? If he asks for an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We're drawing to a close as I make the point of the ultimate purpose and need of prayer. Why does one ultimately need to pray? Not want to, not desire to, but why does one need to pray? It's precisely because of this. Number one, you pray. Second, you have to learn to be persistent because Jesus is saying, when you're asking, when you're seeking, when you're knocking above everything, that I want to give you, what I really want to give you is the Holy Spirit. Above every gift that you're asking, the greatest gift I want to give you is the Holy Spirit. And, and thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, the prophet of the Lord says that God himself, listen to this, God himself cannot give you a greater gift than the Holy Spirit. The prophet of the Lord continues to say that when the Holy Spirit comes, he brings every other blessing with him. Are you still there with me? When the Holy Spirit comes, he brings with himself every other blessing in his train. So my friends, we have a problem. We have a problem on our hands. See, Jesus is saying, 
in the asking, the seeking and the knocking. Don't ask for money in your pocket. Don't seek for a spouse to get married to. Don't knock on a door for a job. But above every asking, seeking and knocking, you should be asking for the Holy Spirit. You should be seeking for the Holy Spirit. You should be knocking on God's door to give you the Holy Spirit because if you receive the Holy Spirit, you will have everything else. My point is not made yet. Why do we need to pray then? Find the Holy Spirit. And often, here's the thing, here's the thing. I used to think, I used to previously think, we need the Holy Spirit to be empowered so that the great gospel commission can be finished and all of us can go home. Does that sound good? Yes. We need the empowerment so that more good preaching, more efficient prayers, and more gospel work can happen, and so that this commission can be finished and Christ can come soon. And I just realized that that is not the ultimate purpose of God wanting us to pray. Because go back to Genesis. Adam and Eve were with God, and sin separated them from God. Isaiah 59 says that. In the sanctuary, God wanted to restore that oneness with man. Revelation says in the end, I want my tabernacle to be with you. I want you to be with me. We fail to understand that throughout the length and breadth of the biblical material, the one desire of God is so that God and man would be united. Why is, where does prayer fit into that context? Because it seems like the sanctuary talked about it. Revelation talked about it. But Jesus is saying... You really need to pray because the greatest gift I want to give you is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. See, ultimately, if you pray, I want to give you above every other gift, I want to give you the Holy Spirit who is God. I want God to finally be in you. Why? Because you are a temple of the Holy Ghost. And if you open your hearts in prayer to God, God himself comes and stays in you. My brothers and sisters, listen, listen. The disciples sitting at the feet of Jesus said, Lord, teach us how to pray. But pay attention. Jesus in physicality is not sitting with us on the pews, is he? No, he's not. So today, our prayer, our questions are not sufficient if we are saying, Lord, teach us how to pray. No, you got to change the context because Jesus is gone. What we need to pray today is, Jesus, come inside of us so that we can pray like you pray. Don't just teach us how to pray. If you teach us how to pray, sometimes we'll pray and sometimes we will not. If you teach us how to pray, we will think that the Lord's prayer is a formula we have to apply. But Jesus, you come and stay inside of us. Holy Spirit, as we pray, you are the greatest gift that we need to receive if you come we will know how to pray how does that sound if you come you will enable us to pray in fact when you come you are the enabler of prayer and you are the answer to our prayer my friend prayer takes up a whole different definition when we look at it through the eyes of Jesus then and when we move up the passage from just saying Lord teach us how to pray and then begin to pray Jesus you move inside of me I want to know how to pray I don't just want to pray any ordinary prayer I want to pray like Jesus how do I do that I can only do that when Jesus is inside of me my brothers and sisters how does one do that how does one do that? Go with me to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. My time is up and I cannot go much longer or else I shall be in trouble. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. The Bible says this. For he who knew no sin, he who knew no sin was made sin for us so that we might be made or we might become the righteousness of God in him. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might be made righteous in him. We might, we might become the righteousness of God in him. If we need Jesus to be in us, if we need the Holy Spirit to be in us, to enable us to pray because this heart is not willing. Have you ever been there? You come home and you don't feel like praying. Have there been days as a Christian, you love God, but sometimes you don't just feel like praying. Why? Because the context is gone. The one who enables you to pray is thrown out. And Jesus is saying above every gift, what you really need, what you really need is the Holy Spirit of God. 
Lord, I want you then to be in my heart to enable me to pray and then become the answer to my prayer because above everything else, that's what I really need. How do I do that? 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells me that he who knew no sin became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God in him. What does it mean to be in Him? That's still tough for me. Number one, how does the Holy Spirit come inside of me? Number two, how, how am I made righteous in Him? This, this concept is difficult to understand. My final passage, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 12. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 12. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 12, the Bible says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Again, again, a difficult passage. Number one, how do I allow the Holy Spirit to come inside of me? Number two, how do I become righteous in Him? Number three, how do I have Jesus? I want the Holy Spirit in. I want to be made righteous in Him. I want to have Jesus. How do I have Jesus? He's not a commodity I can buy. He's not a cloth I can wear. He's not a product I can purchase. How do I have Jesus? My brothers and sisters, have you ever told someone, I have a brother, I have a father, I have a sister, I have a husband, I have a wife, I have a son, I have a daughter. And each time you say, I have, you are signifying that you have a relationship with them, which is why they are your sons, which is why he is your husband, which is why she is your wife. To say that you have them means to have a relationship with them. And so, brothers and sisters, Jesus is saying, I want to come in you to make you pray. Truth is, I don't know how to pray. And having been in the prayer ministry and gone down on my knees and tried to pray, the truth is, this man, wretched, does not know how to pray. And Jesus says, I've solved it for you. I will come in you and make you pray the way you should always be praying. Stop praying for anything else. Stop praying for grades. Stop praying for to be able to look good. Stop praying to get somewhere higher in your ministry. What you need to be praying for is the Holy Spirit because He'll take you there. And so Corinthians says, I want to be made righteous in Him. 1 John 5.12 says, you have to have the Son to be able to experience life. And the Bible is teaching me to have Him means to have a relationship with Him. How do I do that, my brothers and sisters? Knees for Jesus. How does one do that? How does one create that relationship? And the best way I can put it is we, we pray, we pray. The highest purpose of prayer is so that God can be in us. The separation that sin has created through prayer, through knees consecrated for Jesus, that separation can be ended and that union can be experienced one more time. I've got it in the Bible, my friends. There was a demoniac. There was a demoniac who came to Christ, possessed by the devil. The Bible says there was a legion of angels, a legion of fallen angels, I should say. A legion, uh, which is roughly three to four thousand demons in one man. And when he sees Jesus, he ran to him, went down on his knees and says, save me, save me. A demoniac found Jesus on his knees, knees for Jesus. There is a man devout, filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, and when he was being stoned, he was on the ground, the Bible says, when he was being stoned, he did not fall, he dropped on his knees, knees for Jesus. And as they wanted to kill him, the stones kept coming, the blood was oozing and the bones were breaking, but the man's eyes were fixed into heaven and this is what he said. He says, behold, I see the Son of God standing on the right hand of the Father, knees for Jesus. How does one find him? How does one have him? How does one become righteous in him? How does he come in me? To have him means to have a relationship with him. How do I do that? If you're demon possessed and the devil has possessed you and destroy you, knees for Jesus gets you back to Jesus. And if you've gone astray, your Holy Spirit has caught you, captured you, used you like Stephen. When the troubles come, my friend's knees for Jesus will allow you to see Jesus through the stones of life. 
The stones will come, the troubles will come, the blood will ooze. But through the blood you will see the one who shed his blood on the cross, my friend's knees, for Jesus. Peter, a fisherman, so occupied in his business, so busy, wanting and greedy to catch more fish and catch more fish. One day Jesus says, today I will make you fisher of men. Peter goes down on his knees, the Bible says. As he knelt, he dropped at the knees of Jesus, not at his feet. He says Peter knelt and dropped at the knees of Jesus. So his knees met the knees of Jesus and he says, depart from me. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. On his knees, Peter had Jesus knees for Jesus my friends you need to pay attention why because we need Jesus and amazing was the thought my brother shared Wednesday night that theology that there is no theology without neology uh, did you catch that that night there is no theology without neology as I went back home that night the spirit told me that that sentence is not complete there's more to it that there is no theology without neology because if there is no neology if you are not on your knees then you're getting ready for a eulogy you're getting ready for a eulogy which is the praising of someone when they are dead if you are not on your knees you're just praising dead bones that's what you're doing there is no theology without neology. If there is no neology, you are an eulogy because Christology, Christology is the study of the life and works of Christ. Christology is neology. The man spent his entire life on his knees. Knees of Jesus were knees for Jesus. So there is no theology without neology. And if there is no neology, you are a living eulogy. And if uh, there is no neology, one has forgotten what Christology is because Christology is neology. And above all, my friends, if there is no neology, there is you are only a eulogy. You have no idea what Christology is because you will never understand what missiology is. Missiology is the study of missions. You will never know what it means to be mission oriented if knees are not dropped into Jesus. My friends, there is no theology without neology. Without neology, you are a living eulogy. You will never understand Christology because Christology is neology. And without neology and Christology, there is no missiology. There is no mission in the church. My friends, a demoniac found Jesus because his knees were for Jesus. Stephen, a man filled with the Holy Spirit, a leader in the church, when facing struggles, found Jesus on his knees. Peter, caught up in the everyday business of life, so busy gaining more money and getting more rich, understood Christ only when knees went forward for Jesus. Tonight, this evening, my brothers and sisters, somebody needs to find Jesus. Somebody under the sound of my voice is being called home by their Father in heaven. We've forgotten that when we pray, we're not praying to a dictator. This is my Father. How can you be ashamed to talk to your Father? How can you not talk to your Father? no longer possessed by the devil but this time possessed by the Holy Spirit knocked on his home wife and children open and he said hallelujah I have found him I have found him who my soul so long had craved Peter that day as he dropped his knees for Jesus went out and said guys hallelujah I have found him I was fishing I was gathering up I was poor I sought for riches but when I had gathered all the stuff in the world I realized there was still something lacking in me I found it when my knees went forward for Jesus knees for Jesus Stephen says I was a leader in the church I was preaching mighty sermons 
I was a great godly man, but even when I was tested, I could only see Jesus when my knees were for Jesus. Now, brothers and sisters, if you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. To have Him means to have a relationship with Him. And that relationship He wants to seal this evening by knees for Jesus. Knees for Jesus. Maybe there is somebody here this afternoon who has lost sight of Jesus. You've stopped praying. You've been begging. Yeah, you have a formal way of presenting yourself to God, but you've really not been pleading for God to be in you, to teach you and enable you to pray the way He's always wanted you to pray. You fail to understand that the purpose of prayer is for God to be in me. Nothing else. Nothing else. Not the way I look, not the way one preaches, not high ministerial affairs, but above everything else, God in me, the Holy Spirit in me. How do I do that? Knees for Jesus. Somebody has lost him. Somebody does not know what prayer is. And this evening, God is saying, I want knees for Jesus. And if knees for Jesus will happen, you will find him. You will find him. You will find him. You will find him for the one who your soul has so long craved. You've been craving something. You've tried to satisfy it with this and that, but you've understood nothing has been able to satisfy the soul, nothing but Jesus. Do you want to give Jesus a try? Do you want to give Jesus a try? I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes as we close. I'd like you all to bow your heads and close your eyes. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, we've forgotten what prayer is. We've never understood what prayer is. I thought it was about me receiving a blessing. I thought it was about me sounding good. I thought it was about me making an appeal, trying to impress somebody with my grammar and my rhetorics. I forgot, I forgot, dear Lord. That prayer was about persistence. And above all, prayer was about having you in me. That has been your desire through the ages. Lord, this evening I want to come home. I want to have the Son. And I've realized this evening that to have Jesus is to have a relationship with Him. How do I have that relationship? The demoniac is my example. Knees for Jesus. Peter is my example. Knees for Jesus. Stephen is my example. Knees for Jesus. And so, so it is, dear Lord, this evening. So it is, dear Lord, this evening. Knees for Jesus it shall be because I want to rejoice and sing that the one I have lost, I have finally found. I want to shout at the top of my voice and be able to say, Hallelujah, I have found him. Hallelujah, I have found him. All my life long I had panted for a draught from some cool spring that I hoped to quench the burning of the thirst. I felt within Hallelujah I have found Him who oh, my soul so long has craved Jesus said this 
are closed, your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, your heads are bowed. There is nothing new. There is nothing new I could stand before you and say. Prayer has been the very network of one's Christian life. We grew up praying as little children, offering our prayers to God in our own simple ways. Somewhere along the way, we got too caught up in making it sound better and not spirit-filled. And this evening, as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, you've just realized that 
Above every purpose is God's purpose to be in me is why I need to pray. See, over there in Isaiah, he says, seek him while he still may be found. That suggests that there's coming a time when I'll not be able to find him. My brothers and sisters, I plead with you, with your eyes closed and your heads bowed, seek him now while you still can. Seek him now while there's still as an appeal lingering in your ears. Seek him while we still can. We need to have a relationship with him and allow the Holy Spirit to be in us. Because Genesis 6 verse 3 says, the Spirit will not always strive with us. So we do need to seek him now. We do need to pray now while we still can. While we still can. And ultimately, he wants to be in me is why I need to pray. Because when he comes in me, my desires are no longer mine. They are his. My motives are no longer mine, they are His. My inspirations are no longer mine, they are His. My words, my actions, my thoughts, they're all His. And above all, my will becomes His. Because ultimately, He wants us to follow His will at all times as He moves into us. And to that, in the book Christ Object Lesson, page 333 and paragraph 1, with your eyes closed and your heads bowed, I'd like you to recite this with me or repeat this after me. As the will of man, would you like to repeat that with me? As the will of man. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God. One more time. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God. It becomes omnipotent. See, the text is clear. When our will cooperates with the will of God, our will becomes omnipotent. Why? Because it's no longer my will. It is the will of God. And God is omnipotent. And when I surrender my will into his hands, he strengthens me. He enables me. My friends, if you've lost your way and you have not known prayer like you found out through this experience called knees for Jesus. That relationship, that key is missing. And you're seeking restoration. You're seeking that oneness. You're seeking that union with God again. I will request you with your eyes closed and your heads bowed, if you feel the need to restore that connection, would you go on your knees and consecrate them to Jesus? If you feel the need, if you feel the need to be united back with God, if you feel the need, I've lost my way, I don't even know what prayer is anymore, I don't know how to pray right, and I want Jesus in me because if I have son, I have life. If I don't have the son, I don't have life. And to have him means to have a relationship with him. I can't have that if my knees are not consecrated for Jesus. And so tonight I ask you, if you do desire a relationship with the Son of God, will you present your knees for Jesus? Will you kneel if you desire and seek that relationship you've lost, if you've lost sight of Jesus and would like to also rejoice as the demoniac did, as Peter did, as Stephen did. Knees for Jesus have found Jesus. Knees for Jesus have found Jesus. With your eyes closed and your heads bowed and your knees for Jesus, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. We thank you for you are long-suffering, kind, and patient. I ask for forgiveness and I plead for the forgiveness of my brothers and sisters. When we've tarried too long, when we were gathering dust and did not realize, did not realize, Lord, that the dust of this world will be done away with. When what we thought our riches will be turned to dust very soon. Forgive us, Lord, when we've chased self and not the Holy Spirit. I thank you for giving us the privilege to consecrate our knees for Jesus. As your people kneel, call upon you, dedicate their lives to you. Will you please consecrate their knees that the next time they bend, they don't bend to a temptation, 
They don't bend to a bad habit. They don't bend to an evil behavior. They don't bend to peer pressure. They don't bend to struggles. They don't bend to fear. They don't bend to uncertainty. They don't bend to the unknown. They should bend only for Jesus. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have this experience with you. Please, allow our knees, our hearts, to forever, to forever be sealed for Jesus forevermore, so that at the heavenly portal, we can all, hand in hand, be able to sing, Hallelujah, we have found him. Thank you. Thank you, God, for blessing us with the gift of prayer, with one desire, so that you would be in us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.